cousins. He's hanging out with our family. But really, no interest in God. A series of circumstances transpired in recent weeks heading up to Easter. And uh, she actually called and said, can I spend the night with you, Ashley, so I can go to church with you tomorrow? Amen. And uh, we found out in, a, in an email back to Shelly this week that uh, during Easter Sunday morning service, Lanny gave her life to Jesus Christ. <laughs> Uh, going to college, not necessarily the most spiritual environment in the state of California, you'll find. <laughs> Don't tell people who live in Santa Cruz, I just said that, all right? Um, but anyway, but the thing that was really exciting to know that this was more than just an emotional response is, I've got a friend and we're looking for a church, all right? So that is very, very exciting. So anyway, thought I would pass that on. That was a 19-year-old uh, in the quietness of her own heart who gave her life to Jesus Christ. If you're with us today, today I'll be bouncing between both books. There is no conflict between either one of them. The story, just a book with chapters in it. No books like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. No verses uh, written in a story format. It all comes out of here. There are some things in here that are not in here. And so if I confuse you today, just write the scriptures down and hang with me, all right? Because I'm going to be bouncing a lot between both of these particular books. If you're new with us for the very first time... We are on chapter 12 of the story. This is our 12th sermon out of 31. And the thing that we are discovering in every single lesson is the desire of God's heart is to spend time with you. The desire of God's heart is to spend time with you. He doesn't make us. He couldn't make Adam and Eve not choose the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He gave them the choice to hang in a relationship with him or rebel against him. And all throughout the course of history where we've been up till now, we've seen God's great overtures by grace and mercy to let us know that he loves you, he wants to spend time with you, he's not intent on crushing you, he is intent on nurturing you. And we see that again and again and again, and I think we will discover it in today's study as we look at the second half of David's life. Two weeks ago, the week before Easter, we looked at chapter 11, which was the first part of David's life from shepherd boy to him becoming the king that God wanted Israel to have. Today we're going to look at the last part, which is all of his reign over Israel up until his death. Once there was a little boy who lived out in the country. He lived about the time that my dad was born. It would be about that same period of time. Some of you here can remember those days. They used to have to use an outhouse facility for the bathroom needs. Those young people who went on our mission trip Easter week, you found out what that was like. Because there is no inside bathroom where they were doing their work. There were three outhouses about a quarter mile apart. Two downwind, that's the one we recommended most frequently, all right? One was upwind. But anyway, this boy grew up there, and he absolutely hated the outhouse because it was hot in there in the summer, it was freezing cold in there in the winter, and it stunk all the time, winter or summer. So the little boy decided that since the outhouse was on the bank of a creek, one of these days he would push that outhouse into the creek. After a huge spring rain, kind of like one of those we've had this week here, the creek was fully swollen. He found a big stick. He put it under the edge of the outhouse. He pried it up. It fell into the creek and floated away. Later that night, the father of that young man told his son, we're going to the woodshed. That's translated to the 21st century. He's going to get a spanking. And so they headed out behind the house. And the, the, the boy looked up at Dad and said, Dad, whoa, whoa, why are we going to the woodshed? And the father said, son, Somebody today pushed our house over in the creek, and I think it was you, wasn't it, son? The boy answered, yes, Dad, it was me. And then the boy had a stroke of genius. He remembered his history lesson in school. He said, Dad, I read in school that when George Washington cut down the cherry tree, he didn't get in trouble because he told the truth. And the father responded, that's right, son. But George Washington's father wasn't up the cherry tree either when his son cut it down. <laughs> 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 you see, most of 
us have never toppled over an outhouse. But I do suggest that all of us can identify with this young boy in the story in at least three ways. First of all, there is something inside every one of us that prompts us to do wrong. There's not a one of us in here who at various times in our life have not been internally prompted to do that which is wrong. Secondly, this lack of goodness affects all of us. It's part of what prompts us to do wrong. And last of all, there's always consequences to our decisions. This young man experienced all of that. So does King David in chapter 12 of the story. And so do we in the 21st century. We're going to see all of this today as we look at a life of a man who had everything going for him that anybody could possibly want. It seems like that David had the touch of Midas. Everything that he touched turned to gold. Everything that he did was successful. Every enemy that he faced, he defeated he even shows great sensitivity and kindness as he ministers to the needs of a young boy by the name of Mephibosheth. Now try to say that name real fast three times. Actually, don't. No, we're in church. All right? Mephibosheth. And he is a, a grandson to King Saul. But anyway, the world, when David was king, it experienced peace. David personally had rest in his own palatial palace. And then we learn in 2 Samuel chapter 11 that, Sam, that David lets down his guard a bit. And when he let down his guard and he made independent decisions from God, things began to change. Tragic choices were made and it caused a pivotal shift in his life, in his family, and in his kingdom. So let's jump right in and take a look at the second half of David's life. I want to start by looking, first of all, at the very end. I'm going to give you several scriptures. Don't turn there. Just write them down if you want to check them out later. But it sets the stage for us of how this story of David was written. And I think it helps us to understand it a bit. You see, in 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it reads like this. When the time drew near that David was to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son, and to all of Israel. And here's what David said. I am about to go the way of all men on earth. That was a really nice way of David saying, folks, I'm about to die. I'm going to go the way of all men. And he said, so be strong. He looks at Solomon and says, show yourself to be a man. Observe. And being a man didn't mean that Solomon wouldn't cry at the death of his father. Being a man had nothing to do with having a soft and gentle heart. Being a man is described in the next phrase. Observe, Solomon, what the Lord your God requires. Then David rested with his fathers. He died. And he was buried in the city of David, where he had reigned 40 years over Israel. First Chronicles, which covers some of the same time period as what we find in the Kings and in Samuel. In chapter 29, 28 through 30, it says... David died at a good old age, having enjoyed long life, wealth, and honor. As for the events of King David's reign from beginning to end, they are written here. And it tells us where they are written together with the details of his reign and his power and the circumstances that surrounded him and Israel and the kingdoms of all the lands. So what those verses are telling us is is that the story of David was written from the hindsight of his life. Towards the end of his life, David looked back and he told and he recorded, here is my life. Under the inspiration of God, absolutely. But I want you to notice, David doesn't leave out the bad moments. If you and I tend to write our own biography, we kind of jump over the bad stuff, right? We just highlight the good stuff. Somebody wants our resume, and we make sure we, we find a way to sort of go around the bad stuff, and we just highlight the good stuff. So it's important for us to see is David lays this out. Why? Because David wants us to know there are some things that we can learn. Those of us who would read his story years later, there are some things we can learn about how to live with success, and 
there are some things that we can learn about how to live with failure. There's something to learn about good choices. There's something to learn about bad choices. So the message that David writes, for those of you who might be old, I am not admitting to that yet. <laughs> David gives us some wisdom about how to finish well. How to die well. He gives some direction to those that might find themselves in middle age. Do you know David was 30 when he became king of Israel? 30. How many 30 year olds in here? Somebody 30? Raise your hand. You're 30. 31. Okay, got one. Okay, right, right. I'm feeling better. Because let me tell you what I was thinking about earlier today. Do you realize that means that my son Grant could be king? <laughs> That's a little scary, all right? It's a little scary. Over an entire kingdom, you could be king. That's how old David was. We were introduced to David when he was just a shepherd boy, probably 16 years of age. So we're going to discover as we study David's life, there are things for us to learn. And if the heaters are on, could we turn them off? <laughs> That's not part of the story, by the way. <laughs> At the end of his life, David had a reputation of being somebody who had trusted God with his whole heart. And what's interesting about the description of David is, this is not the result of a man who was perfect. This is the description of a man who had imperfections and failures and bad choices. And it's explained to us in the scripture what they were. He doesn't hide them from us. And yet, the summary of David's life that's remembered hundreds of years later is he was a man after God's own heart. And that offers hope and encouragement today to you and to me who are not perfect people. It's a legacy that we can leave behind is that we were a man a woman, a young person who have a heart for God. We'll see how David handled these two key experiences later in his life. The experiences of success and the experiences of failure. Even though David's reputation was that of being the greatest king of the Old Testament, we have to understand that it wasn't because he was perfect. It is this integration and this weaving together of success and failure that allowed David to have such a significant place in the history of God's economy. And he offers that to us even in our life today. This young shepherd boy, chosen by Samuel, anointed to become king. The story begins in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 4, when they anointed David to be king, even while Saul was still sitting on the throne. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 10, this is a great verse for you to write down if you're taking notes. Check it out later. But in 2 Samuel 5, 10, it says that David became more and more powerful. There's a description for why David became more and more powerful. And you have to get this at the very beginning because this is the theme of today's message. It resonates and it explains David's success. For at the end of verse 10, after it says he became more and more powerful, these words are recorded. Because the Lord God Almighty was with him. It was not David's personality. It was not David's genius. It was not David's winsome ways. It was not David's good looks. What brought about the quality of his life was an almighty God who was with him. It's very clear in the first section that there is a relentless succession of stories of David's goodness and his victories that set in the context of a description of David's life. And it's not because David was a great guy, it's because David trusted a great God. In the story, this book, there are some selected stories that illustrate the main events out of the Bible which talk about how David was so victorious. David is depicted throughout the scriptures as a great warrior, a phenomenal prophet, and a wise king. In 2 Samuel chapter 8, the author gives us a litany of names to reveal to us the people that David defeated so that Israel can have more and more of the promised land that God had given to them but was still being occupied by enemy countries. Recorded in the first few verses of 2 Samuel chapter 8 are these names who David defeated. He defeated the Philistines. He defeated the Moabites. He defeated the Aramaeans of Damascus. Verse 6 of 2 Samuel, it says, The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. 
And later in the chapter, he includes victory over the Ammonites and the Amalekites and everybody that lived in the land of Eden. Chapter 8 starts with the words, in the course of time. You see, David's successes were strung out over a period of years as he depended upon God. And as David depended upon God, Israel enjoyed more and more success, more and more victory in their life. I probably don't need to draw this parallel, but I want to. As we look at David sitting on the throne of Israel, and Israel experiencing victory and success in their life, I want you to think about your life being the nation of Israel and Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of your life. I want you to take this historical event and I want you to make it the allegory that I believe it is, the picture of one thing and the image of another, and I want you to learn something about how this applies. Most of us are not going to go out and fight the Amalekites and the Philistines and the Moabites, but you and I are going to fight lust and lying and deception and thievery. You and I are going to fight the battles with selfishness and pride and arrogance and an unkind spirit. And sometimes we get this idea that when we become a Christian, all of a sudden, all the bad stuff in my life is gone. I want you to notice, over a course of time, David and Israel had victory over their enemies. Over the course of time, those things in our hum humanity, our sinful nature, that are distractions to our life, we will experience victory as long as we understand the source of those victories come by our dependence upon our Almighty God. It's easy to look at leaders or people who it seems like everything, they, everything that they do and everything that they say turns to gold. And that was David's reputation. He had the touch of Midas. Whatever land he wanted to conquer, he won. Whatever enemy he wanted to subdue, he defeated. The Lord gave David success wherever he went. This is not a period in David's life that's going to go on endlessly. And isn't that true for most of us? Haven't you experienced a time in your life when things just seem to always go right? I mean, you at least had five minutes of that somewhere, did you? I mean, at least five. But we've had those periods where, wow, everything's in I wonder how long this is going to last. Don't pinch me. I don't want to wake up. Why do we say things like that? Because we know somewhere we're going to run into a wall. We're going to run into a conflict. And how we respond often determines the outcomes of those. And that's exactly what happened today. He's going to come to a bump in the road. He's going to have to make some decisions. Before I leave this this part of the sermon on David's successes and began to look at something about his failures, I want to show you the key to his success. There is one answer that's given to us over and over again in 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings. It's highlighted five times in just two chapters. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 23 in verse 4. It's found in chapter 30, verse 8. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1. 2 Samuel 5, verses 19 and 23. Five times in a very short period of Scripture, there is a small phrase that describes the key to David's victorious life. Here is what the Scripture says on all five of those occasions, plus many other times throughout those books. And it's five words <coughs> mentioned five times. David inquired of the Lord. 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 Is that four? David inquired of the Lord. Five times. Every time David went to battle and conquered a nation, it says that he paused and he inquired of the Lord. David said, God, is this where I should go? Is this the enemy I should confront? Is this the plan that I should use? There is this five-fold description of David depending upon God before he acted. 
Not acting, then inquiring, inquiring before he acts. That phrase gets repeated again and again, and we will discover in his season of failure, that phrase is absent. There's a deep connection here. Now, if you turn the coolers on, maybe you ought to adjust them down. I'm not going to get cold. I'm very comfortable. Some people get chilly, I can tell, so watch the coolers. Okay. It's your comfort. I'm very concerned about it. <laughs> Two things happen in this era where David is experiencing success. First of all, there is the success of battle. He's overcoming all of these other nations. And there are two other areas that David starts to have great success that are also found in the beginning of 2 Samuel. First of all, David is having national success because he's victorious in battle. David is having spiritual progress because he is now concerned about the house of God, the temple. And he's experiencing personal relief because he's keeping commitments that he's made as he remembers a promise to Jonathan and Saul's family. So besides national victory, he's experiencing some spiritual growth and progress as he thinks about the house of God, a place of worship. At the start of 2 Samuel 7, we would read that David's kings went off to war and David stayed in Jerusalem. It doesn't explain why, it just simply says David stayed in Jerusalem. While his men were at war, he was getting reports of their success. Imagine David in this beautiful palace. It's just been constructed. He steps out onto the balcony. He looks up at the beautiful stars. And you wonder if King David couldn't help but remember the shepherd boy David who used to be out in the valley with the sheep late at night, making sure wolves and bears and lions didn't get the sheep. And he was looking up at the same stars. It's just as a shepherd boy, he didn't even have a tent. And now as king, he has a palace. But he realizes the God of the stars is one and the same. David may have changed, but God was the same yesterday. Forever. We wonder if that kind of thinking didn't prompt him to consider what he said on page 158 that would be in chapter 11 of the story, 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 2 in the scriptures, where David says, here I am, I'm living in a palace of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. I used to live in a tent like that, now I live in this beautiful palace. David said something is wrong with that picture. You see, the Ark of the Covenant was the visible presence of God in the community of the nation of Israel. And David said, I'm king, appointed by God. I live in a palace. And that where people gather to worship. <coughs> David said it differently. In the middle of all of his earthly success, the things that made David such a great man was that he always considered God, and it's being revealed right here. Disturbed by the fact of the incongruity of where God was residing symbolically and where he himself lived as king. So David begins to make plans and put things together to build a temple. He imagines this great, incredible palace that will dwarf, I mean, a uh, temple that will dwarf his palace. He remembers stories of the tabernacle, how it had to be disassembled and reassembled every time the people wandered away. It was not a permanent dwelling place. And now Israel, they're putting roots down in the promised land, this country that God had said will be yours till the end of your days. They have a permanent place, and yet God is still in a makeshift tent. So David begins to assemble materials and workers to start the process and then God comes to him in 2 Samuel 7, verse 5. It's page 159 of, the step, uh, 159 of the story. And God says, David, hold on a minute. I appreciate the desire of your heart. But you will not build my temple. I'll let you get the material. I'll let you meet with the architects. I'll let you develop the plan. But you cannot build my temple. Why, God? You see, David's portion in life, his role, his calling, had been as a, a warrior king. Subdue the enemies that have not been thrust out of the land so you can have rest and peace in your country. Your hands have shed too much blood, David. You should not build a house of prayer and worship with a hand that have shed so much blood. Those shed for the right cause. 
my house should not be built by war. But because of the peace I bring through you, your son Solomon will reign in peace, and your son will build the temple. I want you to notice David's response. This is key. Notice he doesn't pout. But it was my idea, God. It was not fair. <laughs> That's not David's response. He doesn't pout. He doesn't whine. He doesn't complain. He doesn't say, hey, it's my idea. I ought to get to do this. David understands that he has a place in God's kingdom. He understands he can fulfill his role. He understands I can get everything ready and make it easier on my son as he steps into this role. Hearing that news, David doesn't get discouraged. He continues with the plans. He continues to give his resources, his offerings. He solicits offerings from the leaders of Israel and from the people to get everything ready for that moment so there's no wasted time. In the midst of God telling him, I love the idea of the temple, start getting it ready, but someone else will finish the job. David says this wonderful prayer. Listen to him. After hearing the news, he won't build the temple. Here is what David prays. Who am I, O oh sovereign Lord? Who am I and who is my family that you should allow us all of the goodness and all of these opportunities? God, we're not worthy. Thank you. In the middle of David's success, he did something that often we don't do. He took time to stop and be grateful. A grateful heart was demonstrated. Three things David reveals to us by this response. He doesn't take his success for granted. He remembers the source of his success, for he had inquired of the Lord. And he turns his face towards God and he pours out his heart. And he says, thanks. David is experiencing battle successes. The people are inheriting the land. The promised land is, is becoming a place of, of rest. David is getting ready to build the, the, the dream of his life. Get the materials together to do it. And in the midst of all that, he remembers something. He remembers a promise he made to his dear friend Jonathan. What an unusual friend for David to have. Jonathan was the son of Saul, who was the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. And yet because Saul rejected God, God rejected Saul and said, none of your children will sit on the throne. Jonathan could have been jealous. Instead, the scripture says that David and Jonathan's heart were knit together as one. They were this good of friends. And David had made a promise to his friend, I'll always take care of the descendants of Saul. How often in success do we forget others? How often in our success do we forget promises we made when we weren't so successful? Any of you ever enter into business with somebody who said, hey, if you'll come help me, if you'll work for nothing or nearly nothing and get this off the ground, man, when we get this business built up, I'm going to share it with you. Only to discover they didn't remember the promise. You ever had anybody promise to do something for you and then fail to do it because they forgot? His life was going so good. Have you ever done that to anyone? See, David, in the midst of success, says, is there something missing in my life? And he says, ooh, in the area of my personal relationships, I made a promise, and I want to keep it. So he calls out to those who work for him, and he said, hey, is there anybody left, anybody at all left in Saul's family? Most of them have been wiped out in the war before David became king. And they went on a hunt, and they found that one boy I talked to about, Mephibosheth. Crippled with both his feet. From that day forward, Mephibosheth put his feet underneath the table of the king, and he ate every meal from David's table. Cared for him for the rest of his life. But all of this is not all that David was. There's more. In 2 Samuel 7, 14 and 15, God says something about David that's very prophetic, very profound, very encompassing. In the middle of David's success, this is not, in, this is not when David was rebellious. This was when David was dependent upon God. God sends Nathan, the preacher for Israel at that time, sends Nathan to David, and he says, give David a message for me. And in the middle of that kind of lengthy message from God to David, here are these words. Remember, these are words in a time of dependence and obedience and success and victory in David's life. And God says to David this, when you do wrong, I will discipline you. But my love will never be taken from you. 
See, Saul, Saul had God's love removed from him. Why? Because Saul never embraced God's love. So isn't there something good to know that when you receive discipline, the discipline is not because people don't love you, but the discipline is because you are loved and nothing will take away that love. So God is letting David know, hey bud, when you hit a bump in the road, when you choose to be willful rather than submissive, I'm going to discipline you because you're mine. But I want you to know, don't ever feel I'm loved in the discipline. I will love you. It's just a couple of chapters after God says those things to David that David messes up. It's kind of like God knew about it. Imagine that. 2 Samuel 11, 1, page 161 of the story. It says, the time of spring has come when troops go off to war. And Joab, the chief general, took the armies of David while David remained back in Jerusalem. First line, first sentences at the beginning of chapter 12. It wasn't external enemies that David was going to fight now. His armies were off fighting other armies. The battle that David is going to fight now and the area where he's vulnerable what lives inside of him. And I suggest the same is for you and me today. The greatest enemies that we face are those enemies that live within us. In 2 Samuel 11, verses 2 through 3, also page 161 of the story, the narration goes like this. One evening, David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace. He couldn't sleep. So he gets up and takes a stroll on the roof of the palace. And he looked down. He should have been looking up. Have you ever lived in a neighborhood where you had a one-story house and people near you had a two- or three-story home? You always had to be careful how you walked around in your backyard now, didn't you? Okay? You had to be careful how you paraded in front of an open window, huh? Because they have a view that most don't. That's David in a palace. He sits higher than everybody else. And so... He's out because he can't sleep. I suggest to you Bathsheba was taking a bath at that time of day because the custom was they took a bath on the roof of their houses where others couldn't see them. She thought certainly at this time of night not even the king up there would be out walking around seeing me take a bath. But a moment of opportunity for trouble. David saw her and the scripture says he saw and thought that she was beautiful and David said someone to find out about her. The news came back that her name was Bathsheba. The story was she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. What was a Hittite? This is good. Hang with me right here. A Hittite is a descendant of Ham, one of the sons of Noah, and it was out of the lineage of Ham that the Canaanite nation came from, and the Hittites were one of the tribes of the nation of Canaan. Enemies. But remember, what was God's purpose for having Israel as his chosen nation. It was so that other nations would see how God cared for Israel and how Israel loved God and other nations would want to have a relationship with the God of Israel. And it was happening. In this season of victory that David had as king, Israel lived in such a way that the Hittites, Canaanites, sworn enemies of Israel, Here's a guy who said, wow, I want to have a relationship with the God of Israel. And he now became one of the chief warriors in King David's army. Wow, powerful stuff. She's been married to this guy. And so David said, well, 